play copyright games, win public domain prizes with better buddies. Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ. With us this week, it's John. Hello. And James. Hello. Our Better Buddies icebreaker this week, what's the funniest thing you've seen recently online? It's a tough competition. This is tough. Yeah. (laughs) I I guess I'll go first. Yeah, Uh, go for it. I saw something the other day that I really considered sending you, and I probably should have, RJ. Uh-huh. But it was, like, one of those, like, AI voice memes. Um, and it was about Batman having a conversation with Two-Face. <laughs> but, like, Two-Face was just Harvey Dent with a burned face. Like, he was totally normal, totally sane. But Batman's like, no, you're a villain because you're ugly. <laughs> <laughs> this tragedy makes you evil like no i'm I'm, I'm fine like no (laughs) oh man (laughs) that's actually great satire that's pretty good you're ugly or a doctor that means you're a criminal in gotham city (laughs) yep gosh i need to find that i'll I'll go find that and post it for you guys well i'm gonna speaking of kind of ai things i don't know if this is ai voiced or not but i saw a lego video the other day somebody did like a stop motion thing um to, it's anakin and the chancellor but for whatever reason there's a thick yoda in the background like they put like le- tan lego studs on the yoda legs to make him thick thick uh and Very it's odd. a real quick little like facebook real thing where anakin's like step on a crack break your father's back uh, or your mother's back or whatever and chancellor's like anakin you don't have one so then Anakin says, step on a crack, break a Sith Lord's back, and the Chancellor, like, his legs come off as his leg breaks, and Anakin freaks out, like, oh, I knew it! <laughs> so Sith Lord. That's pretty good. I like that. Hey, I watched that one a couple times. What about you, James? Funniest thing you've seen on the internet recently? Dude, I literally... I mean, I'm online too much. I well, so you should have an answer then. I should, <laughs> I should, but I I douse myself in all this material. Um, so switch to the other focus. Well, what the hell? Oh, he got the kidnapped. Has removed him. <laughs> <laughs> he's on, he's online too much. The internet said no. <laughs> oh, he's back. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why that happened. The internet I mean, said like... you were online too much. Yeah, I did. It, it called me out. I got called out. Um, fuck. Hold on. So, most recent... What's the most recent funny thing you've seen, then, if trying to figure out the funniest? Uh, I was, like, scrolling through my photos, uh, because I... Anyone want to guess how many photos I have on my phone? Too many. 4,800. Is that, is that your... That's is that your guess? guess? Forty eight hundred. All right. I'm gonna go. RJ, f- do you want? I'm gonna go forty seven ninety nine, just in case it's Price is Right rules. Oh no! You're actually RJ is the closest. It's forty nine thousand five hundred thirty one. I'm fucking closest. I'm closest. The you fuck said forty eight hundred, and I said forty seven ninety nine. Oh shit! Oh, never mind. The Johnson. <laughs> you have, yeah. Wait, you have forty-seven thousand pictures. I have forty-nine thousand. Forty-nine thousand five hundred thirty-one photos on my phone. Like probably two percent of them are of like me and my family. Oh gosh, <laughs> dude, it is 2% literally is still just a lot. End- it's it's endless screen caps. It's like it's just fucking at like you guys have no. Scroll through my phone and you will see the internet. Like, I'll, Hang on, I'll, I'm going to go out to New York you. real quick and grab your phone so I can scroll through it. I'll, I'll give it to you sometime, but I, I take no responsibility for what's on there. You can ask me any question you want, but I am not, I'm not obligated we to We can do. ask, but you won't answer. 
And <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. James, um, why do you have so many pictures of roofs? Uh, Just roof after that's roof. A, that's a great question. You know, I uh, blueprints of government buildings. <laughs> Hey, those are, that's my personal private business. That's uh, that's important. That's uh, that has nothing to do with you yet. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll. This is this is me being this is me being edgy. So you're you're not you're not going to be able to. Um, I actually have low disk space. I gotta I gotta make some room. Oh, uh, hold Lord. on. Uh, I bet I know what's actually. You have to delete that two percent of family photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta delete the the family photos. Gotta go, dude. That's or, uh, uh, it's... for comparison purposes. I have twenty seven hundred photos on my phone. I don't Holy actually know fuck, how many photos I have dude. on my phone. <laughs> wow, it's like you guys don't spend useless amounts of time on the internet. That's crazy. Oh, I do. Don't you worry. I just don't document any of it. Apparently, I I guess I do. I guess I really do. I I don't know that as... I can count how many photos I have. Oh, my gallery just told me at the top. Oh, I got Google Photos, so it didn't it didn't just tell me. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Oh, wait. Nope, that's not. Okay. Well, if you uh, donate to our Patreon at the $5 a month tier, you may find out how many photos our chat has in his phone. Oh, <laughs> I'll just so upload all of them and you, somebody can count for me. <laughs> I'm, down for, I'm down for that. For uh, legal least... reasons, that was a joke. But... <laughs> Nothing's a joke. It's for a joke. Uh, hold on. Anyway, what's your thing? So I'll send. I'll send it to you. But again, I you're not. You're like you're not going to be able to to repeat this. Um, oh, this is an example of the of the the just the oh, cream no. of the crop um, internet <laughs> humor. Uh, if it's going to let we just me stick to Lisa Al memes. No, no, we can't. No, but I I specifically just requested that. Like I, I don't even know if you guys are necessarily going to find this funny, but um, I think I think it's I think it's like kind of funny. My my dream is to one day like go through my screen caps and just like I want some of them as like portraits in my home. Um, like I want like I think I think like I think in the Met or the MoMA there should be like an internet wing. Like I think internet art should be like a a thing, but I'm I'm very biased. Um, Fair. Oh my fucking god! Hold There's on, a hold Facebook on, page on. I follow called Paperback Paradise that does edits of old book covers, and they are hilarious. <laughs> what the fuck? Like I don't know why I love this type of shit, but I kind of do. I think it's I think it's just like really really funny. That, so it's um, a meme of Hayao Miyazaki, if I understand correctly. Yeah. It's a picture of Hayao Miyazaki, and I'm not reading all of the caption. Yeah, you, can. yeah, you uh, can't. But nah, I'm finna do my own thing. Nah, blankly, oh, yeah. blankly, blank. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, hold on here. There's like, there's just like so much, like, This is shit a response meme. It's like one you would send in response to somebody. Yeah, it's very, um, it's, again, it's like, I find it like almost artistic um in a way or another word it's like but nature yeah, I, when you accidentally get a good nature shot yeah it kind of is that's actually an excellent yeah that that's mainly what i do online is i i love like taking screen caps of like comments you're an online like, doc you're an online photographer i'd like to think so i'd like to think so but that that's giving me like way too much credit like <laughs> no, 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 way no, you're not too bird much watcher. Credit. that's what you are yeah it's you're not it a professional is. you don't know what you're doing but you just go on the internet you watch what the birds are saying and doing and you sometimes can identify specific birds and you take pictures of your birds but oh, it's just for your own benefit you, you you don't share them with anyone you just have all these bird pictures yeah basically my hope is like it's very it's very um conceited but it's like oh man it'd be really funny if like one day like they just like someone found my phone and they could just like look through this like very deep slice of the internet of like the example of like oh this is like you know what's i wouldn't say what the average person but this is like James an example just shared another you know? one that appears to be a picture of a 
cl- classroom with it's, a lot of soldiers, it's... but also students in it. And the caption yeah. underneath is "Battle Royale is the answer." It's it's uh, it's from the movie. It's a, there's a movie called uh, "Battle Royale," and that's where it's from. Oh, um, so it's an answer as to what the question is or what the picture is. Got it? Yeah, it's uh, hold on. I'm just gonna say, I'll but send it's a few very these, humorous but... to have this picture of a man in a tracksuit standing in front in the middle of a classroom with all these students sitting around him, and it's just "Battle Royale is the answer," as if he's about to make the students fight. Yeah, I love this type of shit. I really do. Um, I really, really do. I, I just love like these like artifacts, you know, from like the internet. I think artifacts it's like is a strong word. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that's that's very fair. It's like going to a flea market and finding somebody's like slightly older, but it's not like old like toy car. And it's like. This is a Hot Wheels car from, like, 30, 40 years ago. So it's old, but, like, it's not that valuable. Not yet. That You want to you wanna get in, like, you want to get in while you still have the eye. It's like a common baseball bef- card from, like, 50 years ago where it's like, yeah, it's not, like, it's not a current baseball card. It has gained a little bit of value, but, like, it was a common, so there's plenty of them out there. He's yeah. just playing the NFT long game. He's yeah, going to serialize every single screenshot in his gallery. <laughs> if we turn enough exactly, of the internet into NFTs. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I, I mean, honestly, dude, what I know you were kind of like riffing there, but like internet baseball cards is like, that's honestly. That's just what NF- I'm NFTs surprised. were. I, I mean, but like physical, like that, like physical like internet cards or like i've i'm actually interested as to the copyright laws of some of the stuff like could i theoretically and nobody get any ideas but like (laughs) could i take these screenshots and put them on a t-shirt and sell that so like probably not right you could um but it's a matter of form and material right so because you are changing the material of the good, you like particularly with the screenshots you've shared with us right now, you could go out. Because these are not copyrighted or owned by anyone. It's just out on the internet. Now maybe, especially with like the second one where you're like, oh, this is from a specific movie, that might get you. Unless it falls under fair use because it's been modified enough by the other aspects in the picture with the captioning and everything, and then even further being modified to be put it on a t-shirt. Okay. Um, the flip side of that, though, is can how who's going to fight you on it, and how much of, have you transformed the original work to be unique? Yeah, I, I do think it's like, I think there's, a, there's an argument that, like, because it basically it's, it's it has to be removed enough from the original context where it it you know um becomes something new yeah which is really difficult because you know for instance someone could pick up the shirt because they recognize it as like battle royale but there's a there's a debate that it's like it's not a battle royale shirt it's like it's it's a, I think, I think that's an element to point you know? out is the like the Hayao Miyazaki picture, right? Of like, Mm -hmm. that is a picture of Hayao Miyazaki, but he probably doesn't have a copyright to his own face. What about the, uh, like, what if that was taken from a publication? Like an article about him or something. Then they would have the copyright to that picture, but in turn it becomes a question of, does the reposting on the internet forum and the fact that it's a screenshot of the forum itself, not the picture modify it enough and then from there because it's on a t-shirt is that different enough yeah because that's the question then it's like could you take for instance like of the mona lisa if someone posted the mona lisa on their instagram you were scrolling through it in their feed could you take a screenshot of the instagram feed so you see the mona lisa because there's a like i could definitely see some like edgy like art kid like myself doing that where it's like you know, you take you take a screenshot of the Instagram, you know, because the, the, 
the idea of the shirt is no it's no longer that it's the mona lisa it's like that the mona lisa is almost like staring at you through time through the window of like the instagram feed and that's like an interesting recontextualization but you're still banking quite literally on the recognizability of the mona lisa you know like well and i drawing think too, like potential. i swear i've seen like some like specifically with the mona lisa i swear i've seen some like modification image edit where like they just add a phone into her hands or something yeah yeah and like sell that as a t-shirt so i do want to make it clear i i like it's very tempting to me but i honestly think it kind of breaks like a silent rule like i think it kind of like i don't think you should monetize the internet to that extent like i think that's like the idea that like these people and i you know who knows like how legitimate like i mean people posting online really yes, is but but have you looked into the world of content theft on the internet isn't that more of a reason though to like kind of try and keep things like within the family so to speak like isn't that a reason to sort of like try and not you know i think add to i feel like everything the, the is already so it. monetized Everything is already so monetized, and there's the content thieves and farms where they literally are literally just taking like popular videos and splicing them on with another image that just like sits there and does the loopy thing or like people making food or whatever, and then they post that up because that gets more views for them. Where it's like, you know what? If they're doing that, why don't I get mine by selling T-shirts with memes on them? You know. Yeah, I just feel, I feel like it's, like, I'm not going to say untenable. Like, I'm not going to say, like, I wouldn't do it necessarily. But I have to, like, you really have to pick. Because I, I, I really do think, like, um, like I think it's kind of crossing a line. Like, I, I think, like, because the problem is, is one person starts doing it, oh, then you're going to have, like, a bunch it. of people. I, I, I know, it's just, like the idea of like monetizing it again to that extent or something that like it's already happening james it, it's been happening since the internet was created uh, maybe the I'm minute just, somebody like, figured out you could make money with the internet they started doing it and every time someone's discovered a new way to make money with the internet they do it i mean hell that's a whole issue with like Redbubble and stuff is people like stealing images and designs and memes and selling them as designs on Redbubble and whatever other like created yourself sites there are what do you what do you, john what do you think what's your opinion i'm interested because I, I i i'm like tipping a little with rj but i'm obviously still hesitant i'm kind of on rj's end of it like redbubble and etsy and all the user content generated sites are just rife with copying each other like even the other day i was doing my duolingo and there were mobile ads with like Nintendo sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> Just like blatant really? rip off. Yeah, oh, like yeah. the warp going down the warp pipe. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It, it's just crazy. This is, this is actually really interesting to me because I do think like I think this brings up something that's like very nice to the internet that's like kind of important. Um do you, guys, do you guys mind if I, like, riff on this, like, a little bit? Do you mind if what? I, like, kind of explain? What are you doing? I, I just, like, I'm just saying, like, so, like, it's interesting right now because, um, you know, like I've been saying over and over, like, I've been doing a lot of reading on, like, the economy, um, okay. on, like, how our economy is structured and how it functions. And really, like, you know you really do kind of own like nothing like you own it in the sense that it's like within your general vicinity. And there's this agreement that because you like exchanged currency for it or some kind of like valuable, you know, good or service or whatever that it is like yours. But like most of our money is debt. Most of our money is like constantly moving in and out of like our financial systems. Like there's no, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not trying to be nihilistic. It's just like, it's kind of just like how it, works like there's uh -huh. no real like um what i would call like stability in the sense of like this is the thing that i have because like the do for instance the dollar that you have is like you know the money you have in the bank is just technically what they owe you when you come if you came to ask them for it yeah. like 
that's just what they say they have because they can the minute you give them your money whether it's electronic or physical they can trade it everywhere they want so yeah. like in an economic system that ironically like was born from very staunch beliefs and like property rights and the individual which has like kind of like again i like ironically tipped into almost like an extreme leftist like communist utopia where everything is like shared and nothing is really owned by anyone necessarily like obviously there are quotes around this but okay it's interest yeah. for money i see where you're coming from but mm -hmm. i'm looking at three bookshelves full of books and i don't think anybody's gonna tell me i don't own those books so that's 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 like yeah, that like I I think there are delineations. Like I do think there are sort of obviously differences. I I I think though what's interesting is like with the internet is I think you could almost make the same case that like the internet is in a way it functions much like um I don't want to say a market because I find that word sometimes like gross and the idea that the internet is res like revolves only around transaction I think is like t way too reductive but just the, the in the sense of it being a market with the constant influx of information and how much things are kind of like scrambled together and and you know chopped up and and reassembled and all that i don't so know i, think I, see I what mean you're saying, it, but i think i'm, I'm <clears throat> picturing it like a bazaar right of like oh here's all these yeah. shops and tents and places and things and so if somebody has like they're selling cloth and somebody comes up, takes that bolt of cloth and says, look at this cloth I'm selling. Well, yeah, that's just fucking theft. But if somebody takes the cloth and stitches it into a, a vest or whatever and says, please buy my vest, the person who had the cloth, even if it was stolen, can't come over and say, well, give me that my cloth back. It's not cloth anymore. So, so and the, the parallel I'm seeing is like YouTube okay. copyright strikes where... There's actually, like, known accounts where, like, people will just either create or steal sound bites that they didn't even originally own and then copyright strike the original owners on it because they just got to their first to copyright strike. That's kind of funny. It's, it's like, but that's bad. It's funny like, until you consider, like, like yeah. you're doing this to channels that are trying to, like, survive off that and if they get three copyright strikes in a row, they're, they lose their monetization yeah okay okay i i like I, but it's that one, it, that example yeah. is also more of the first one where it's like they literally steal the cloth and then say this is my cloth why'd you take that from me yeah because i'm i'm of the opinion that like once it's on the internet it's like fair game like once it and i don't mean like i should qualify that like i don't mean like oh I can take like once you upload your movie on the internet, I can take it and re-upload it and make it. like I think that's ridiculous. I think that's obviously just like blatantly stealing. But the idea that like some people are being copied, like if some kid, let's say, makes a movie, um, and they put like you know, they put it online and it has like the Rolling Stones or like yeah. Biggie Smalls or whatever, I don't think that should be no. Necess I don't think it should be taken down. I think there's an argument like, should you be able to make money with this? Like, that's a that's a that's a fair argument, possibly. Like, I would debate that genuinely. Yeah. But like, the idea of it being taken down because it's like, oh, well, you used something that wasn't yours. I think it's like, again, if we're circling back to, I don't mean to get too extraneous here, but if we're circling back to that idea about the economy, like. The idea that everyone is kind of borrowing from something, someone, something from someone all the time makes that concept flimsier, I think, yeah. uh, especially when you're talking about multinational corporations who really don't own anything, who really just deal in a constant change of ownership over these over these things. So I don't know. I, I'm it, it, I think it's a space that has yet to be like further developed in terms of like it's like some of the some of the culturally accepted rules um because i just think like a lot of stuff comes from the culture of the internet where it's like let's take things and like i think let's so mix them together thought, and i haven't fully thought the thought but mm -hmm. in my gut it tells it's saying that this is a one of the earliest stages of the 
pre and post scarcity blend or like the scarcity post scarcity blend of the internet is infinite and human creation on the internet is infinite. People can always and constantly create things. And as long as the servers are maintained and whatever, like you'll never really lose it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's tied into a scarcity economy in the real world in the sense of people getting paid for things and monetized and advertisements and that stuff. So it's this weird blend of people are very defensive of it because this is how I make money for the real world to be able to buy real things that are scarce and require uh, trade, but they can, it's the internet is infinite. So there's all kinds of new content everywhere, constantly all the time. So no one ever runs out of having content or really making content. It's just a matter of, is the viewership and attention enough to get the real world benefits I need? Yeah, and once you kind of cross into that real world, that's that's a good point that like the Which scarcity why, like, becomes... Yeah, so borrowing and making new things from stuff on the internet is really not a problem, but people get very defensive over it if you do. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's, um, it kind of, like, when you talk, we're talking about the market of the bazaar, it honestly kind of reminds me of, like, like if, you know, in New York, if you go down to, down to Chinatown, like, you're going to walk past whole, uh, streets where it's basically just, like, the same store just copy and pasted where it's, like, I Heart New York or, like, New York Best Store or, and they're usually run by, like, like, Indian guys or, like, you know, Chinese people or, like, like, at, like, you know, the, like people who I'm not like they have a connection to the culture, obviously, yeah. but it's like they're selling very it's it's very clear, like they found a market and they are like just, you know, it's all the same shit. Like you could walk in any store and basically buy the exact same shirt yeah. eight different times, you know, so I love New York. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. So I guess that's the, it's kind of just that, but now taken to like an online marketplace and I think that's actually really astute, RJ, that the struggle becomes like, or the, it's the crucial like inflection or transition points of like when you're moving it offline, like then reality, like reality comes back into effect and you have to kind of consider. Well, and I that, think too, you know? like continuing with that comparison, <laughs> if we're looking at these tourist shops in, again, say Chinatown in New York, you can have 20 of them in a row. But if the 21st is unsuccessful, it goes down, right? Like, it, it disappears, they can't keep it afloat, whatever. Mm -hmm. But with the content on the internet, you can have 300, 3,000 podcasts run by white guys. It's literally a stereotype that every, like, second podcast on the internet is just a bunch of white guys talking in a microphone thinking they have something new to say. And... But it, because numbers, as long as they're not, like, relying on that for their income to survive on in the real world, it doesn't matter how successful it is. They can continue it for fucking ever. If yeah, it's that's... something they want to keep doing. True. But it's it's not going to be market forces that shut them down. It's entirely within their choice. Yeah, unless they decide to monetize, in which case then they're Then they're like, interacting with the real world and being subject to market forces. Yeah, which is which is interesting. Like, I I still think there are like, like, uh, I I think we're gonna see like our generation. I'm not. I don't think copyright is gonna go away, but I think like like how some of the copyright laws stand today, especially you know, famously after oh. all the Disney stuff, like. I think those are going to seem totally archaic, but I think it's gonna it's gonna make this era look like we were painting with like two colors. It's gonna make it look, mm. I mean, at least institutionally, I will say, like it's gonna like, be very. Yeah, I feel like as long as we have Disney around, we're not going to see a lot of change on that front. I think you don't think so. I think there's going to be change, but I think it's going to be slow, very slow, particularly because we've got, like John said, we got Disney. And Disney has been fighting copyright for fucking ever. Because copyright was originally only, like, 50 years or some shit. And Disney kept going and they realized, oh, fuck, if we follow this copyright law, we're going to lose Mickey Mouse. And then we were fucked. Which is why, like, they keep redesigning Mickey Mouse so that 
like we have Steamboat Willie became public domain and they went, all right, you can have it because we don't use that anymore. Now here's current Mickey. I didn't even think about that, about the oh, consistent yeah. redesign. Oh, like, I was just like, oh, um, they're updating him for the era, but that's no, actually... No, my, yeah, wow. my family's got a magnet from like their... Either the 75th or the 100th Disney anniversary, where it's like all the different Mickeys across time. And like, yeah, the design update is to keep him with whatever the era is. But every single time it's a new design, that's a new copyright. I okay so with Mickey Mouse like I can see that like original characters I think like you are well within your rights to extend like those copyrights uh I don't know if I'd say indefinitely but for a long time like I yeah that argument I can see the the issue that I have that I think is like the more boilerplate one especially as regards to like Disney is like the idea of copywriting you know very old stories like the idea of well, like don't. oh you you can't don't didn't they put copyrights on like some of those fairy tales no Did they not no it's all public domain it's just you can't do their version of it so you can't use their design of snow white you can't use their design for cinderella you can't mm. use winnie the pooh with the red shirt exactly that's why um actually there's a great <laughs> ca- example of that one f- that john brought up in the comic book fables the entire fables comic book is creator owned and published by dc comics by warner brothers and they have Snow White, Cinderella, Pinocchio, Robin Hood, um, the three bears, the three little pigs, the big bad wolf. They, there's even a store run by a Mr. Sanders where they kind of towed the line of like, eh, it's technically Winnie the Pooh. We're not going to tell you it's Winnie the Pooh because we don't want to risk Disney suing our ass, but it's Winnie the Pooh. Mm. Colonel Sanders. Right, Colonel Hunter Sanders. Acre Wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's where the secret spices come from. I was gonna say the spice mines. Colonel and Sanders, like, Dune, but it's just Colonel Sanders. <laughs> it's like fried chicken is the empire. Remember, I think that's part of the. Uh, no, that's actually right in the creation of the Fables storyline. Spoilers for the Fables comic book. Originally, the big bad was supposed to be Peter Pan, and they realized Disney technically. I think Disney had bought up the copyright on Peter Pan specifically. Because it was more recent and more new, it wasn't like an, it wasn't an original Brothers Grimm fairy tale. So instead of risking it, they just switched over to having Pin, uh, Geppetto from Pinocchio being the big bad guy. Ah, uh, I mean, I, like this stuff is fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm like more than willing to like. I, I can be very rash and anti-authoritarian at the same time. <laughs> um. So, like, I, I get, I know authoritarian isn't, like, anti, like, just authority, like, in general, you know, because I'm edgy and cool, but, yeah. and, but like, and it can be very misdirected. So, you know, so a lot of times when I'm talking, it's more like venting. And I do think that obviously these laws have, like, a place. It's just, it's going to be interesting to see how they change because, I, mean, I don't really... know about you, but. Oh, go, sorry, continue. I was just gonna say I want to see I want to see now I want to see Dune but with Colonel Sand I want to see Dune but the the spacefaring empire is uh, see what you is, could that's is, the beauty of parody. Kentucky Fried Chicken that would fall yeah, into parody that, that's that's actually very true that is that is that does change it enough um, and also going back to like the Disney thing. One of the reasons Disney has gotten away with it for so long is because they had the money and the lawyers for it. They fucking fought tooth and nail. Whereas a lot of these other smaller estates, such as the owners of Frank Herbert's Dune, uh, the let, we'll use the Back to the Future trilogy. The, it's in the will of the creators of Back to the Future that like control passes down to their next generation, and they will not be a sequel or a remake. I mean. So like really, yeah, no, wow. it's it's in their wills of like we are not remaking Back to the Future. Fuck you. But that's probably gonna mean it's gonna last long enough to end up in the public domain. That's and then once cool. it's in public domain, anything's free game. Yeah, Making I just, a remake, baby. I, <laughs> Sherlock I mean, Holmes. At that point, Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain. Like. What I'm excited for is like when, you know, when something like 
back to the future passes into the public domain. Like, I think that's actually really cool because it's basically, that is the sign that your story has moved from like just a really good movie or a book or a character to becoming a part of like a myth. Like they've gone from, it is now truly I'm like I'm gonna see in some way stood me. that, that test of time. I, I think it's really cool. And I think like in a way, uh, like back to the future is a great like American candidate for like an American myth. Like the, you know, the idea of being able to somehow change, change the future is a very, um, I mean, it's a human ideal, but I think it's very exemplified and, and kind of, uh, I, can't, I, can't, I like to imagine the Revolutionary Army is uh, just nothing but a bunch of Marty McFlies. Wait, are you, are you kidding me? Hang on. Um, <clears throat> so I'm looking at, there's a Wikipedia page for 2024 in public domain. List of creators whose works enter the public domain in 2024. Okay. Um, in America. Um, oh. I mean, his his stories have to be in there already. I'm assuming. Trying to see. The house at Pooh Corner, uh, with by A. A. Milne, including the character Tigger, entered the public domain in 2024. Um. Charlie Chaplin's The Circus is in public domain now. Is it how many years is it? Like 95, 98? Uh, it depends. So there's countries with a life of 70 plus years, some with 60, some with 50, and some with 80. Wow. What um, some of it's like death of the author plus a certain amount of time too, right? I, I oh, think wait, you're right. Uh, on copyright that. on films is the entire life of the creator plus 70 years. Holy yeah. shit. So dude. long time. Until Robert Zemeckis. So it's Robert Zemeckis' death plus 70. Oh. That's Let me painful. check if Robert Zemeckis is still alive. I think he is. He, he's definitely still alive. I Robert wonder if Zemeckis, that would be. Um, I wonder if that would be over. Is seventy one years old right now? Dude, what but you he's say, not John? dead yet. I wonder if that like specific law would be overridden by the clause in his will, though. Um. To pass it on to next of kin. No, so no, mm. because that's. That's what Disney did, and it's because of Disney that it's Death of the Creator plus 70. So it was the death of Walt Disney plus 70 years. Which is why it took this long for Steamboat Willie to come out. Um, So even though it's passed on to the next of kin, it's still the death of the creator plus X amount of time to become public domain. It's odd though, I thought, Dis did, did Disney die in the 50s? I thought he died in the 60s. He died post World War Two. Um, Walt Disney died. Walt Disney. Walt Disney died in 1966. So that's. I wonder why Steamboat Willie became. Maybe. Yeah, that's odd. I wonder why. Maybe they added like. Maybe they like averaged it or something. That's odd that it became. I don't know. Uh, public domain now. Um, Let's see. maybe. Hmm. No, I don't know. Just wondering if the cutoff, like Duke what Law School. Here we go. Oh boy. Um. Let's see. It's a night. Uh, so it's a drama situation of Mickey Disney public domain and lawyers. Um, oh, you know what? It wasn't a movie. Uh -huh. That's why. It was a short, it wasn't like a full feature length film. Um, so that changes, that changes the duration. That's what I suspect oh, based yeah. on skimming this okay. article. Um, so it also still falls under trademark. So you cannot use Mickey in a way that misleads consumers into thinking your work is produced or sponsored by Disney. Yeah, that's fair. That's, I mean, I can see that. So you can use, I mean, you can use Steamboat Willie. I, yeah, I just think, like, for instance, um, like, if somebody wanted to, 
10 years ago have someone watching Steamboat Willie for just a brief moment in a cut of a scene in a movie. Like the idea that, I don't know. I mean, oh, I so, maybe, maybe. Okay, here's what it yeah. is. Um, the uh, Life of the author plus 70 years for a maximum of 95 years. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay. So, like, however much time passes between the creation of the object and the death of the author with a maximum of 95 years. So it's plus 70 years or 95 years, whichever would come first. So it's interesting, which means back to the future. I mean, it'll still be, but that's why like the Steamboat tw- Willie came out in 1926, which is 95 years ago. That is really fascinating. Actually. I, I yeah. We're way too into that. this for, for this podcast episode. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's cool, kind of. Uh, 1985 film. So yeah, we're not going to get that until 82, 2080. We're breaking the trend of white men just saying things on a podcast, and we're white men researching things on a podcast. Yeah, we're different. All right, we're, different. we're cool. Subscribe. Only 56 <laughs> years until we can public domain back to the future. Let's go. What does that even hey. mean? Like, I, I feel like copyright has hindered my creativity to a point where I can only think of any updates being in parody. So, like, what could we do with Back to the Future in public domain? So, when a thing is in public domain, that means the characters, art, story, literally everything about it is free use, fair game, do whatever you want with it. Yeah. Like you could re- yes. you could try and republish it in its entirety if you really wanted to. It's why um publishers can basically take like King Arthur's tales and republish them any which way they want with this... things taken out, things added in. You could change it to sci-fi, don't worry about it, you're all good. Um but because of the difference in public domain versus and copyright versus trademark it goes back to that you can't say it's from Disney if you're publishing a Steamboat Willie cartoon. You can't mislead people. You gotta have it clear in the, like, titles and say, like, published by Better Buddies. Not affiliated with Disney. This is why, like, it's, um, you know, if you think about the history of, like, art, most art has really just been, like, kind of reproductions of kind of, like, very well-known cultural stories, right? So, like, the easiest example for the West is like, you know, the New Testament and, you know, examples of the Renaissance with like painting, you know, all of those paintings involve figures and characters from various stories that were well known to the people of like that time period and, and continue to persist. And like the idea is that in kind of a healthy society, that we have these stories that are very groundbreaking and connect with us on deep levels. And that, you know, they're able to kind of be put into this continuum, um, this, this almost in a sense, like a, a large sprawling portrait of like all of our cultural figures that we can begin to use as touchstones and young artists can then use, you know, if a young writer wanted to write a back to the future story in their own style and try and, and try and sell that. You know they could if if a young filmmaker wanted to do the same thing, then they could. And it, this is the difference between us and older societies: is that you know we do have this concept of ownership, but we have like a much more advanced economic system um, where now truly, like it's not resources, but it's information and culture that is so that are really really the most valuable things you could a- have. So it's like I think it's an, hard easy, an easy yeah. way to look at it. Mm-hmm. Look at all the variations on Frankenstein and Dracula to, that have been made, right? Yeah, those are good examples. Yeah, yeah, they're perfect examples of public domain because we all know the story. They're still getting published. I've got a, I mean, I'm looking at a copy of Dracula on my shelf right now that was put out. I don't know who the publisher was, but it was the Barnes and Noble special edition with the cool red cover, and mm-hmm. publishing companies can put out their own versions of Dracula. Well, there's literally a guy who 
uh, there's an account I follow called Dracula Daily. It's somebody who took all of the Dracula story and reordered it to release it as emails in order of the on the dates that it occurs. So like start and it goes for like a full year plus to tell the Dracula story in chronological time frame. So like if the letter is dated 311 2024 like 311 and then the next day letter is dated 315, you won't get in the next part of the story until 315. But they're publishing that as like a published book compared to like the original Dracula story, which kind of goes back and forth a little bit based on like letters and news events and things. So if it's in the public domain, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. You can parody, you can just republish it. If you want, how many people are going to buy it? That's up to you, but. Mm. And okay. it's, uh, part yeah. of it too, though, is if you're an artist <laughs> wanting to do something with it, you got to do something with it. Because if your version of it's not better than the free one, why the fuck would they publish you? Like, imagine basically, like, if certain... I mean, I'm sure that there are, lot, like, types of code or things like that. Like, obviously parts of, like, video game engines are copyrighted. But imagine if, like, certain mathematical formulas were copyrighted and you couldn't use them unless you were authorized to do so by like a larger authority and you had to pay them a fee i don't know if it's like such a thing exists I, i'm sure yeah, that again pythagoras like a foundation <laughs> what'd you say the pythagoras. You gotta pay the pythagoras foundation yeah you gotta pay the yeah exactly like so it's like it's difficult because it does like creativity does flourish in limitation but you can't like it, it still needs room to kind of like explore. It needs like that, you know, creativity in any field, not just the arts. So like, I, I again, I think it's tough because I don't, you know, I don't have, none of us have works that are like well-known. Like we don't really have anything yet that's like too valuable to steal from an idea perspective. Although, you know, just wait till this podcast blows up and then we'll see. But it, it's, uh, it's an interesting debate. I just, I think, you know, all a country really has sometimes, or all group of people have, sometimes all we have is people are stories and like the stories we're able to tell ourselves and each other. And uh, ha ex like no one really loses out too much when a story is allowed to sort of pass into that second life of, of the public domain. Um, it, it, we, we all become, slightly richer for it so i don't know um I'm, I'm a big fan of the idea i just wish it was executed a little bit I, differently i honestly think public do like public domain and copyright exp expiration is at a decent place like i don't want to see it extended if it came shorter i'd be okay with that but i think it's kind of fine to like let the person who created the thing enjoy the fact that they created the thing while they're alive right yeah yeah. By the time those no, I, by the, like the 95 years, that's long enough out where you know what? Have at it. Also side note, by uh, 2057, Amazing Fantasy 15 will be in the public domain, which means Spider-Man's original appearance and all associated will be free to use. That's pretty cool. Uh do we want to do recommendations or advice? Probably mm. recommendations. Better Buddies recommend. We recommend a piece of media to enjoy while it's still in copyright. Here we go. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Wait, we need that qualification? Oh, I gotta change my... No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go first. Because I've basically finished it. Um, I've been watching Drawfee's Drawtectives Season 1. Mmm... It's very amusing. It's been a little bit background noise, just because, like, once they start doing the drawings, it's kind of like, okay, it's like listening to a podcast, they're riffing, chit-chatting a little bit while the person does their drawing. But there's been enough funny moments, like, sprinkled throughout while they're doing that, where it's it's like, caught, held on to me. And it's fun seeing them, like, with their characters, doing the character thing. Um, it's also been very enlightening, having... Because there was a episode of Not Another D&D podcast where... As part of their Dungeon Court series, they had two of the Drawfee people, uh, Julia Le Petit and Nathan Yaffion. And 
in it, Julia bemoans having to, like, that they just started season two of Draw Detectives, and she's absolutely losing her mind as the runner of the game, trying to get them to just draw the thing. Like, for the <laughs> love of God, please just draw what you were asked to draw. Please. Or just draw in the first place, like... Yes, it's a murder mystery where every single person you talk to wants you to draw something. It's dumb, just do the drawing. We're a drawing channel. Uh, but the characters are pretty fun. The designs are f- great. Uh, and in turn, it's put me onto the Drawfy channel, and in particular, uh, Julia Le Petit trying to draw cartoon characters from memory, which are atrocious. <laughs> it's just bad. And Pokemon from memory, and a room yep. full of vampires. I have never seen a more square headed uh, Bobby from King of the Hill. <laughs> Draw fee's great. But yeah, Draw Detective Season 1. It's fun. It's weird. It's it's a good good time. Who's next? Um I can go fairly quick. Um so my recommendation this week is actually a show that Calvin put me on. Um, I'm watching the Shogun show mm. um, that's currently being released. Uh, it's through FX in America, um, but I watch it on Hulu. Um, and it's kind of the story of feudal Japan uh, towards the end of the 1600s, I think. I yep. might have the year wrong. But um, it's about this guy who's an Englishman uh, sailing on a Dutch ship, and they're trying to, like bring the rest of Europe into the Japanese market, which Portugal has like an exclusive hold on at the time. So this guy washes up in Japan after circumnavigating the whole world. Like they went from Europe through South America to Japan. (laughs) That just sounds brutal, but they took a long way around was. Yeah. Um, and then it's kind of just like in the midst of, a time of political instability. Uh, There was a a guy called the Tycho who kind of led a revolution, um, completely reformatted the way the country works, but then he dies and leaves an heir that's only like seven when he dies. So then these five lords step up to be a council, and then political infighting uh, is happening, a la Game of Thrones, but like, you know, things that happen in the real world. (laughs) Yeah. so yeah, it, uh, my favorite part of it is that like the language barrier is very real. Like the titch- or the lead character Blackthorn, um, he just speaks Portuguese. Like he doesn't speak any Japanese coming into this, so he's reliant on um, Portuguese people and Japanese people who have learned Portuguese so far through the lens of like being Catholic. Yep. Um, to translate for him and help him understand the world around him. But a lot of those people are inherently biased against him because he's uh, Protestant and they're Catholic. And he's English. And he's English. So it's just kind of an interesting dynamic that he's in this world that's completely foreign to him and dependent on his, like, unantagonistic forces to understand it. Um, which if I... I'm understanding timelines correctly. You could watch Shogun and then turn around and watch Blue Eye Samurai because they're cro- in the real world chronolo- chrono- chronology in order. Because this is pre Japan closing, I believe, and then that is post. It might be the other way around. Cool. Oh. But yeah, I um, I also picked up the book uh, because I have a long flight coming up, and I I think it'd be good to. Read and I'm also impatient waiting for the show to come out because <laughs> it's still actively coming out. But he does this really interesting thing where, like, in the same breath, he will transition the POV character. Mm. So, like, you have Blackthorn in the village talking to, like, the headman of the village who speaks very little Portuguese. Um, so it's like Blackthorn not understanding him, like, what's going on here. And then you shift to the headman's perspective, and he's like, wow, this savage is here. Like, why doesn't he want to take a bath? Oh, yeah, Calvin mentioned seamless. that. <laughs> yeah. Calvin says something about, like, the 
English bathe like once a week or once a month or whatever, and the once Japanese month. bathe like regularly. Daily. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> well, you want me to take a bath? I'll catch the flux. Yep. <laughs> like, okay, Blackthorn. <laughs> but yeah, it's just um it's just opened my eyes to cultural differences, especially in the context of the like the age of exploration. Where you hear these things like, oh yeah, the Spanish went and conquered South America. But they're framed in a way where you like don't think of the indigenous perspective at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, where this kind of brings that out a lot more. It's like, yeah, these are people with their own culture and everything. And Europe's just here stomping around. <laughs> and it really, a lot, of, like you said, like a lot of the colonialization mm-hmm. aspect really was just through sheer force of we're going to keep pushing because we're too stupid to know when to stop. That and religion, uh, like. Yeah. One, it, one line that I really appreciate from the show is that he meets this, um, like, Spanish pilot, uh, ship pilot, throughout his journeys. And, like, he says, when you see Osaka, you realize these guys aren't barbarians. <laughs> like, yeah. They know what they're doing. <laughs> well, and that was one of those things, too. I remember, uh, I don't remember when I learned it, but learning about, like, in, like, uh, grade school, you were like, oh, the Native American tribes in no- in North America lived in teepees and tents and wigwams and things and moved around. And then it's like, oh, no, they had some major cities, like, yeah. massive cities that could rival any in Europe. And it's like, oh, that was neat. Cool. Way, if, way, way to go on destroying those cultural touchstones, American colonists. Yay. So. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited to see where the story goes. Um, I mean, the books came out in, like, 95. Oh. So, the story is complete in written form. And history happened in the 1600s. Well, yes, it's also <laughs> pretty much based... Oh, sorry, the book came out in 1975, so it's uh-huh. very long over. But, yeah, wow. it's, it's pretty much based on real events, if not a direct telling of them. So. Cool. Yeah, that's a that's a cool perspective. Um, insightful, absolutely. What are you going to recommend, James? We've hit two ends um, of the spectrum here. Where how are we balancing the scale? We, well, I'm going to recommend a research paper I've been reading. Actually, um, it's uh, called. Right, I already hit the snooze buttons. Yeah, sorry guys. It's <laughs> a cool a subscription. Lord. Uh, actually it's not, you have to, you have to sign up for a site, but you do not have to pay. Is um, it peer reviewed? I believe so. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I can check, but I am, I'm sure that it is. Uh, the research paper is called, uh, the Spotify teardown. It's actually like a uh, long enough to be a book. It's, oh, it's like, uh, all, all, it's almost 200 pages. Um, I think it's actually a little over 200 pages and it is basically i'm maybe 70 pages in 60 70 uh and it's basically looking at spotify's business model from its very beginning and tracing it through sort of to the to what was the present day when the research paper came out which was 2018 okay um and uh, like I've been saying, like I've been reading a lot about economics and finance, and I started reading. This is actually the paper that turned me on to all this stuff, and I kind of like spun off of this paper into all the other reading. But what interested me was like um, the how these companies basically approach um, what they're doing, and like what you know why. Um, like, I don't know how much, I I don't know if you heard, but in October, September, October of 20, uh, of, of last year of 2023, uh, Bandcamp, the website Bandcamp was bought by a music licensing, um, platform. So this music licensor is the people who license songs to supermarkets and radio stations and, you know, trailers and all this other stuff. And 
it's interesting because Bandcamp is a very like I'm not going to say it's like the most you know it's it's not like it's on the internet it, it by definition it can't be the most like staunchly independent like anti-systemic thing anything that's online is systematized to some degree but um it's a very it's very independently minded it's all like the the amount of stuff you can just find on Bandcamp is insane um and there were fears that when you know they were initially bought by song trader uh, because they're actually owned by epic for a little while like Hmm. epic games um and uh there were fears that there are fears still that basically what's going to happen is that bank is slowly going to be sort of like colonized by the attitudes of the the music licensing industry so they're really going to crack down on sampling on like borrowed stuff it actually tips into a lot of what we were talking about before Hmm. um and this got me interested in like uh, Spotify and kind of like the business relations that it has. And this is what the paper talks about. Basically, like the idea that Spotify kind of did not like Spotify did not start out as like necessarily a like we're going to free music to the people. It was really just a tech company that was kind of like we deal in the distribution of of media. Um, And then it eventually found its niche in music and how like basically these companies um, that are, that are built, they, they, they start to function like trading platforms. They, they, they basically view like art. I'm not trying to be too uh, much of a hippie here, but basically like art loses pretty much all value except for the monetary. Like it, they view songs or albums or artists as musical commodities securities that they are trading on their platform like that that is what is happening like these people you become nothing more than a, a unit of information that can be exchanged uh, for currency that's a set that's what you are um and like how does something like this happen like I find it, I, I, is it emblematic of basically what's happened with like our culture where, you know, where again, where information and ideas are sort of held at a primacy, like, you know, these systems emerge that on their face, on their surface appear like, oh, we're spreading music around for everybody. And like, we're spreading art, but really what they're seeking to do, it's kind of like, I don't really know an apt metaphor. It'd be like, uh, uh be like an oil company coming in and being like oh we're actually like we're we're digging swimming pools you know like this is good this is like we're digging a community pool we're once we're done you can have- to every community in the tri-state area and yeah. oh we found oil in this one so we're keeping it yeah yeah and like you can use it like you know there's a better metaphor, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's resource extraction is sort of yeah. what it is. And it's just very, it's very interesting to me where like, basically at, on a, at a certain point, Spotify is no different from like an investment bank or, or like, a uh, uh, something like Oracle or another tech company that's Push just back. really seeking Don't pay for to Spotify categorize. premium. Yeah, I mean, basically, and here's here's the interesting thing, you guys, because like, it's not just about selling music. And we obviously know, like, you know, Facebook on its surface is like, oh, connect with your friends and blah, 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 like social relations. But really what it is, it's a data mining facility. And in Spotify is the same thing. Like one really interesting piece of the paper that I've gotten to that I think is just fascinating is how they talk about how. Uh, around 2010 or 2011, the dashboard of Spotify changed. Yep. Initially, it would just recommend you songs and albums and things like that. But it changed around 2010 or 2011, where now it recommends you stuff based on your mood. And and they're able to track your where mood. you are, yeah, what you're doing, who you're doing it with, like where you might be, because... Keep in mind that Spotify has integrations with other social media platforms yep. and these they coordinate. So like they can they there's a possible data exchange that's going on between, you know, Facebook and Spotify where it's like, oh, you know, RJ was listening to RJ clicked the I'm in my feelings playlist. Where was he? What time of year was this? Like 
where did he post anything relevant to this? Like, See, and I will just never know, forget the one time I was in my car listening to Spotify. I don't have premium. The ad started to roll. I got seven ads in a row, four of which were for Spotify premium. I got four want, out of seven well, ads for their own premium service. They, yeah, they want you to, they want you to have uninterrupted access because it means to them, because it means they have un- uninterrupted access to you. Because what they will do then is they will take that information and they will sell it to advertisers. And that's, and that's how they, that is how they keep the model. Like, well, that's it. Initially Spotify said like, Oh, it's free music. We're just going to, ha- we're, it's going to be advertisers. Like that's where our revenue is going to come from. But uh, uh, obviously like shortly after that. Yeah. Pivoted, it's the intensification um, model. They get the users, then they turn around and make it good for the advertisers. Then they turn around and sell out both of them. Yeah, have you read that article? Oh, yeah. I actually... oh, I've read enough about it, and the Cory Doctorow is a yeah. real uh, interesting guy. He's he's one of the people that I read a little bit of his article. I thought he sounded I've a little too. He he was a little too internet y for me sometimes, uh, yeah. in a certain way. But I I understood what he was saying, and there there were some other people that he was linking to where I was like. Oh, this is this is valuable. This is cool. He's definitely terminally um, online, but he's very much to the, his benefit terminally online. Of like, in being so online, he also is studying and paying attention to trends and the way things work. Hmm. He's not just bitching and moaning and needing to go outside and touch grass. He's like, yeah, actually cognizant and paying attention. It's astute. He's actually writing like long form stuff and he's, you know, there's, there's something, there's at least something there. Yeah. He's not just like doing it in the wind and he's not, it's not just like empty, um, necessarily. Yeah. No, I, so I would, I would recommend it. It it is, I will say it is a little dry and it like, it is, um, it, it tends to be a little over intellectualized. Like sometimes you just want them to get to the point. It is. And it's written by, uh, Swedish people who are very like their social structure is very uh, left wing compared yeah. to ours, com- comparative to ours. So, so there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of almost like Marxist adjacent talk. And I'm not saying this to be like uh, alarmist. I'm saying it because that's the texture of the material. It's, so it's it's, it's very knowledge. You need to be able to understand the text. It's it, yeah. At the very least, it's a little verbose. Uh, so, but. It's really interesting. I, I I would recommend it. Like if you're looking for kind of an examination of like this product that I feel like has become kind of uh, ubiquitous. And I feel like especially because Spotify seems to, its aesthetic is like, we're the cool, edgy, different music platform. We're not like that stiff old Apple. Like we're, we're where the real independent artists hang out. And it's like, are you're you? not band camp. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts to feel a little Steve Buscemi, hello fellow kids, uh, yeah. um, a little bit. But yeah, I, I Spotify teardown, Ch- check it out. Just skim it, even um, you might find some interesting stuff. Cool deal. Well, thank you both for joining this week. Thanks. Yeah. Always Thanks a pleasure. Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for letting us use the song "Living in the Moment" off the album Cross Off Yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else fine podcasts are sold. We're also on social media. Our Facebook is Better Buddies, where we have our meme Mondays. Our Twitter account is at Better Budcast. Use the hashtag Better Buddies when you tweet about the show. And our Gmail is BetterBuddiesCast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love and or war, icebreakers you want us to answer, questions you need advice on, or story ideas you want us to flush out. Again, go subscribe to our YouTube. We post our shorts and clips from the episodes there. And last but not least, be a better buddy. Uh, trying to keep long hair, style it, like, weird, but I was, like, thinking on the train. I was like, you know, I've never, like, tried a hairstyle before where I could shift it on different days to like fit my moods. Mm. I feel like so that's a very like a yeah. mood ring. You're investing in a mood haircut. Yeah. I, I, I want to say, I feel like that's a very guy thought to have. So late in life where it's like, Oh, I don't need to have like one haircut for everything. Like 
I, I should have like a style of hair that like I can style on different days, you know, like 